work for, for the global research and analysis team uh, at Kaspersky Lab. Uh, I started working there in 2009 and uh, in Poland, uh, and now I'm based uh, in UK. Uh, I enjoy uh, reverse engineering, I enjoy uh, playing with malware, messing up with Linux, and I also enjoy uh, playing Baldur's Gate, which uh, I mention here on purpose. It's not like it's my Facebook page or something. Um, uh, in my abstract, uh, I stated that uh, rootkits are currently on decline, and I heard some people were uh, saying that it's a bold statement, so I prepared some statistics. Um, the statistics are based on our uh, KSN system, which is Kaspersky Security Network, and um, uh, this is the uh, detection rate uh, per day uh, per uh, most uh, known uh, rootkit families for uh, 32 bits. So we can see that uh, there is a slow uh, decrease uh, in the detection of 33-bit uh, rootkits. And uh, also uh, for 64-bit rootkits, we can see that there was some decrease. Uh, this is the, uh, this, these are the statistics uh, uh, from the um, uh, period of one year. Uh, and uh, those statistics include all the 64-bit uh, uh, rootkit families that we detect. Uh, so uh, my, my claims are not uh, without any proofs. And um, why, why, is it, why is it happening? Uh, I think um, current times are uh, really tough times for rootkits because 64-bit uh, uh, operating systems have uh, much better security against uh, malware that is running in the kernel space. So uh, the kernel space is basically no longer safe uh, for malware to run and to hide in. Uh, also, boot kits are not a very good um, um, solution for cyber criminals because uh, uh, the changes uh, made to the boot record are easily detect by, uh, detected by current uh, antivirus solutions. Uh, there were some ideas of hypervisor le level rootkits, like uh, virtualization rootkits. Uh, the ideas were very nice, uh, very, uh, very clever, but um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us, uh, they didn't um, got adopted uh, in widespread malware. So the ideas uh, are back uh, into two 2005, 2006, and we have uh, year 2014, and we didn't see any single malware. Um, widespread malware in the wild malware that would um, uh, use those techniques. Uh, it's probably because uh, the complexity of implementation of such techniques are, is, uh, is too big for um, cyber criminals to, to actually um, implement it, uh, spend resources on implementing it. Uh, and all those reasons um, forced uh, a certain shift uh, in the malware strategy. Um, uh, for now, uh, I would say that malware, uh, malware um, goal is not to hide from the administrator, but more to evade, more to uh, um, go around the uh, uh, detection system. Uh, so yeah, uh, two, three years ago, uh, the goal of the uh, malware was to hide as well as possible, so nobody can see the malware, and the malware can persistently um, work on the system. Now. Uh, it's, uh, it's more about uh, bypassing the detection. Uh, also, uh, another goal is to protect the CNC infrastructure, which means uh, to keep the CNC addresses, uh, IP addresses um, um, secret and uh, to um, allow uh, CNC servers to run as long as possible before uh, they will get um, uh, disabled, taken over. Uh, also, uh, the other goal is to protect the payload. So um, the payload usually um, uh, is, um, is downloaded at the very end. So we have uh, layers of loaders and downloaders and uh, a subsequent uh, execu executable file that um, download other files that download other files. And at the end, at the bottom, we, we have the actual payload which is usually encrypted, obfuscated, and uh, it's not easy to get it. Um, I will uh, talk about five uh, most um, interesting cases of malware I came across uh, last uh, mm, several months. And the first case I would like to uh, describe is the uh, Trojan called Baldur. It catched my, uh, my attention because um, there was an email on uh, II mailing list. Um, people were asking about this Trojan, and it catched my attention um, 
first because of the name. As I was a, a Baldur, Baldur's Gate, Gate player 15 years ago, I was uh, really, really much into that. And uh, the second thing was that uh, people were mentioning anti-sandboxing um, anti uh, techniques that are used in this malware. So I thought, okay, if this malware proves um, worthy to include it in my presentation, I will uh, buy an iPad and play uh, Baldur's Gate again on iPad. And well, uh, let's say uh, this malware wasn't very uh, exciting, wasn't very uh, interesting, wasn't... Um, the thing I was expecting, uh, but uh, anyway, it's a textbook example, so um, I wanted to um, include it in, the, in this presentation because it uses uh, most of the classical, uh, simple uh, anti-virtual um, machine and anti-debugging checks. And also I wanted to, to buy an iPad and play uh, Baldur's Gate, obviously. So that's why it made uh, into my presentation. Uh, so first checks are really simple. It's uh, the check of is the de is debugger pre with the use of the is debugger present API um, and the check remote debugger present and the other check uh, based on the tick count. And what is interesting here, um, uh, the malware writers made a mistake uh, where where we have a J um, a JGE instruction jump if greater or equal. Uh, it should be um, jump if less, uh, because it, um, it uh, checks the, uh, the, tick, uh, the tick count be between in two instructions, and for uh, malware, for, uh, for the execution in the normal environment without uh, a sandbox or without a, a mm, virtual machine or without a debugger, uh, the, mm, the result should be less than the, this value uh, which um, is stated there, the one C2, I don't uh, remember the um, decimal value of it. Anyway, it, uh, it jumps um, to, uh, to other checks, so it passes this check uh, if the value is greater than that. So it passes the check only if it's run in the sandbox or in the VM or uh, in the debugger. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty lame um, bug. Uh, then we have some checks about uh, checks for um, windows that are opened uh, in the system uh, and the window names like Oli debugger like Outruns. Uh, also we have some uh, checks for um, windows with the names like GDK window top level which is a default name for uh, GTK applications and I was googling about that because I, I'm not sure which application is targeted by the malware here but I would say maybe it's a WinSpy which is a like, commercial spyware uh, product uh, which is um, written in um, GTK and uh, it, um, it uses this, uh, this window name. Another one is also uh, some default uh, name and also I was um, trying to figure out which application uh, may it target. Um, and what I found on Google is uh, that uh, uh, Malwarebytes anti-malware solution use this, uh, this uh, name for a window as well. Uh, also we have checks for, uh, for the username. Uh, and uh, the maltest is the username uh, which, um, which is used by uh, Avast Sandbox. And there is um, some strange username, which is Tequila Boom Boom. I have no idea what is that, uh, which uh, sandbox or honeypot or application uses that, but I was able to track uh, this, uh, this um, user uh, to uh, use the IP in France. I think it's some uh, honeypot uh, set up in, uh, in a on a French server, something like that. Also, we have other checks, like uh, the check for the um, name of the physical drive uh, in the registry. Uh, and um, this is uh, something very classical. The, those checks are, did, are done by almost, uh, by most of the malware. Uh, and those are checks for VirtualBox, for uh, QM, and for um, VMware. What is uh, interesting here is the uh, check uh, for, um, for the API uh, called the wine get unix file name and obviously it's the API that is included in uh, wine DLL, wine kernel 32 version of uh, um, kernel 32 DLL uh, wine version. Um, there is uh, other interesting check which is, uh, which is the check of uh, the size of the uh, hard drive and if the hard drive is less than some specified value, it's uh, probably run, uh, being run in the sandbox or virtual machine. Um, 
If the malware uh, detects that something is wrong, that uh, it's run in sandbox or uh, that it's being monitored, it uh, does uh, the crash, but uh, it's like uh, you can't see on the first uh, gl uh, glimpse that uh, this code would crash the, um, the operating system. Uh, it's, uh, why, why, is, uh, why it happens? It's uh, just because that there is no stack adjustment uh, before return. So uh, the, the address, uh, the return address, the value of the return address of the, on the stack is invalid. So it will return to some uh, non-readable address and it will crash. Uh, a second example, uh, this one actually I liked very much uh, because it's, um, uh, it's a multi-staged um, exploit which drops uh, a very um, nicely protected uh, binary, uh, which was a spyware, some generic spyware. Not, nothing, the, the, the main payload was not uh, very interesting, but what was interesting about this sample was uh, exactly the exploit, which used a lot of uh, anti-heuristic techniques and uh, uh, the mm, loader of the binary, which was uh, also using a lot of um, anti-sandboxing and uh, uh, anti-VM checks. Um, I wrote an article about uh, the exploit itself, uh, this version of this exploit. So if you are interested uh, in the more details about the exploit, you can uh, go to the secure list and uh, try to find this article. Um, so uh, the shellcode uh, had um, four stages, which is not really uh, very um, common. Uh, it had a ROP chain, it had uh, the decryptor stage, the egg, ha egg hunter stage, and uh, finally the, uh, shell, uh, the, um, the final stage of the shellcode was a uh, dropper of the malware. Uh, here we can see that uh, it was uh, consist, uh, consisting of uh, multiple OLE objects, uh, which uh, was uh, used as an anti-heuristic technique. Uh, also, there is some obfuscation. We can see that there is a list view class ID, which is um, uh, used uh, by, by this kind of exploits uh, for, for CV0158. But it's obfuscated with uh, brackets, so uh, heuristics engines uh, can't rely on, uh, on the signature anymore in this case. Uh, also, other constant that uh, this exploit uses are obfuscated in, in the same way and uh, the size that uh, triggers the, the exploit the, mm, uh, exploit is also obfuscated. Uh, we have a uh, uh, first part of, of the code is a ROP shell code. So um, we can see it's, uh, it's, um, it uses a DLL that is loaded to the memory at the address 27 blah blah blah. Uh, which actually I just, um, I just found one version of this DLL. It's a MSOCTLX uh, library. Uh, but I checked uh, 10 or 15 versions, and only one was uh, com um, compatible with this exploit. So um, I don't know. Uh, maybe they didn't um, include uh, uh, the other libraries. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, then uh, after the uh, ROP, uh, there is a uh, decryptor part which uh, starts with FSTNV instruction, which is D9EE, -E, uh, and uh, it uses this instruction to obtain uh, um, EIP, instruction pointer, uh, which is also uh, something uh, really rare. It's, it's old technique, but it's uh, rarely used uh, in, uh, in contemporary exploits. Uh, this is the egg hunter uh, part. Uh, it uh, goes through the memory and looks for the signature, and uh, it uses the isbat read PTR um, function uh, to check if the memory uh, is readable or not. Uh, once it finds uh, the, the signature, uh, it decrypts the code which comes after the signature, and uh, the code is uh, the, the uh, MZ file, and after the MZ file, the stage uh, four of the shell code. And after the decryption, it, proce it proceeds to the uh, fourth stage of the shell code. And the fourth stage, uh, what is interesting about the fourth stage is that it, it uses a COM object to, uh, to run the binary. So it, it's also not very common technique. And, um, I'm not sure why is it used. Is it uh, some anti-heuristic um, 
trick or something, but uh, yeah, it's the first time I, I saw something like that in, in the shell code. Uh, uh, the payload uh, it decrypts the loader, and um, yeah, the first, uh, the, the only function actually in the, uh, that, that is not uh, the, uh, encrypted in the uh, downloaded MZ is the main function, which uh, which has a decryption routine, and the decryption routine is uh, interesting because uh, it computes the uh, the XOR key, the key for decryption. Uh, based on the uh, system uh, time, on the year fr uh, got from the system time. So depending on the year that is set on the computer, uh, the, the key is different. And uh, the, it will be decrypted um, properly only for the year 2013. So uh, it's, uh, it's a binary which lives only for one year. Actually, not even, because there is uh, another check for a month. And if the month is... Um, is uh, equal to December, uh, there, there are some calculations, and uh, finally the code will uh, crash. So uh, the, the expiry date of this uh, uh, binary is um, end of November 2013. After that date, it will not run properly. Uh, yep. mm. Then, uh, after the decryption, this, uh, this uh, malware has a lot of uh, checks, um, the, the simple anti-debugger and anti-VM checks, uh, that like, I, like the ones I uh, showed you in the previous example, so I didn't include them here. Uh, but what is uh, interesting, again, uh, there is a kind of backdoor uh, which allows probably the developer to skip all the checks to debug uh, the, the binary or something. And um, it, uh, it computes the hash uh, based on the computer name. And if the hash is equal to 20, C7, blah, blah, uh, it uh, just skips all the check and goes to uh, the next uh, mm, part. Uh, it also sets, uh, before, before the checks, it sets the SEIH routine. Uh, and uh, obviously, it's a malicious function, so it will, um, cra uh, it will um, trigger the exception later to, to execute the uh, SEH uh, routine. Uh, yeah, after all checks, or uh, if in case uh, of the, of the um, uh, backdoor, um, it uh, goes uh, to this code here. And uh, like I said, it uh, tries to trigger access violation uh, by uh, trying to uh, write into non-readable uh, memory. And if there is no exception, it's, it means that something is uh, wrong because on the normal system there would be an exception. So if something is wrong or if any uh, of those b checks before failed, it goes to the dummy code. And uh, what is the dummy code? The dummy code is just a backdoor code uh, which uh, is really simple and small and doesn't do nothing. Uh, so it just basically uh, open the ports, listen, uh, listen on it, and, and that's all. So if, uh, if any sandbox VM is detected, it just opens this backdoor and do nothing. Uh, if, uh, if everything goes okay, according to the malware, uh, there should be uh, exception triggered and uh, the SEH routine should be uh, executed. So inside the SEH routine, first uh, the malware checks the exception code, which has to be equal to exception access violation. If it's not, it just uh, returns, exits. Uh, then it confirmed the exception address, which uh, has to be equal to the address that malware um, sets, uh, that the exception occurred. And uh, uh, yes, ag again, if it's not correct, it just exits. And after that, uh, it uh, writes uh, some arguments uh, to the stack uh, using context record and uh, overwrite EIP in the context context record with the uh, pointer to the uh, next function. Uh, so after that, it just will uh, run the decrypt run code function with the arguments, uh, next say, dec decrypt function, the next argument uh, encrypted dropper code, and the next argument uh, 40 uh, age. Um, then uh, it proceeds to, uh, to the resolve uh, APIs. Uh, and uh, what is interesting about uh, this thing here is that um, 
uh, it uses um, some kind of anti-hook, uh, anti-break point, point technique, uh, uh, which um, um, in which it um, mm, copies the first instruction from the uh, API, and after this first instruction, it copies uh, jump to uh, to the address of the API plus two. Uh, so. Um, well, to, uh, to understand it better, uh, yeah, you can see it here. Uh, it goes, uh, after it resolves each uh, API, uh, it cop uh, copies the first instruction, uh, and then moves, uh, copies the first instruction to the buffer, like from example, uh, for example, move EDI, EDI, and then it jumps uh, uh, to, uh, then it copies um, a jump instruction, uh, followed by the address of API minus uh, this function. Uh, so in the memory, it, it looks uh, like that. There is a, an array of, um, I, I call it code snippets, but uh, we can call it trampoline as well. Uh, which um, uh, are con consist, uh, consist of the first instruction of the API, then the uh, jump to the API. And uh, if, uh, if there is um, some breakpoint uh, put on the API, uh, like on the first, uh, it's usually put on the first instruction of the API. So uh, if during the execution of the code, uh, someone will put breakpoint on, uh, on the API, malware will not see this breakpoint because it will use this, uh, this uh, trampoline to get to the API, not um, the API call itself. So it will skip the first instruction, which would be uh, overwritten by the breakpoint. Uh, and this, uh, this sample is for recreate key XA, so you can see that there is a move EDI, EDI, ja, uh, jump, uh, recreate uh, key XA plus zero two. Um, after that, uh, malware creates a, a MSI exec process, and uh, it creates it in the suspended state, and then it overrides uh, the entry point of this process with a push, push, uh, push and the address of the next stage function and uh, return. Uh, so uh, after resuming this process, uh, it, it, uh, it will effectively go to the next um, stage decrypt function. Uh, what is uh, interesting about uh, uh, the main payload, uh, there is only one thing interesting about it, because the main payload here was a simple bot that responded to a few commands like uh, push file uh, from the server, uh, download something, blah, 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 but it's, uh, it's really nothing exciting. What is uh, interesting is uh, that it uses the uh, APC procedure to uh, decrypt uh, the URLs um, of uh, CNC servers. Uh, I don't know why, actually, but uh, it's the first time I see something like that in malware, so I thought maybe it's uh, worth mentioning. Another case uh, of password stealer, uh, which was also delivered with uh, actually the same exploit, a little bit uh, different, the obfuscation technique uh, was a little bit different, but uh, besides that it was the same thing. And uh, it uses um, uh, SEH in a different manner. Uh, it's um, uh, in the uh, main f win main function. Uh, there is only this code. There is nothing else. It's just like it sets the SEH and then it triggers uh, the exception. So um, basically, it uses the SEH chain to execute code blocks. <laughs> Uh, so here, uh, when the division by zero exception will be triggered, the control will pass to the exception handler, which uh, this is the exception record. We can see that uh, the exception record uh, contains two functions that handle the exception, but the first function that will be uh, executed is the handler 11, uh, which uh, again triggers, just triggers the exception. Uh, after the, this second exception, the handler uh, handler uh, 12 will be executed, and this is the handler 12, uh, which uh, contains um, anti-sandboxing, anti-emulator technique, um, uh, which I call dormant phase. Uh, it, it's just uh, um, a loop of uh, doing nothing, sleeping, doing nothing, sleeping, doing nothing. 
uh, which, uh, which uh, aims to overrun the sandbox or emulator because uh, usually there is some specified um, time, uh, time frame in which uh, the sample is run. So um, on my computer was like 10 or 15 minutes uh, uh, this, this dormant phase, so I think it would uh, overrun pretty much uh, all of the most popular um, sandboxes and emulators. Uh, then it decrypts uh, the, the rest of the code, the next phase of the code, and uh, then it sets the exception handler number two and triggers the exception and so on. Uh, in the exception number uh, three, it checks um, the, uh, if the trend uh, micro uh, product is installed. It, uh, it does that by checking the registry uh, key uh, and the path of the, uh, of the binary, trend micro binary. Uh, if there is no trend micro, it will inject to uh, SVC holes, but if it finds trend micro, it would prefer to, to inject to, uh, to antivirus, um, to trend micro antivirus product. Uh, so, and then, and then it sets uh, a second exception handler, uh, no, fourth actually, and triggers the exception uh, as before uh, by doing uh, division by zero. Uh, here in the, uh, this is the exception record for uh, the exception number four. And uh, we have four functions, but the first function executed will be handler 44, uh, which uh, create, creates a process, either trend microprocess on, or SVC host process, suspended, obviously. And uh, it will try to um, overwrite this process uh, with, uh, uh, with a malicious code. It also uh, decrypts the main payload into the binary, so it, um, it decrypts the payload and, and save it, saves it uh, as a binary value in the registry uh, in the key, um, just HKLM or HKCU software and the uh, value name is RAR. Um, the next uh, case is about uh, Zeus, and uh, well, I was monitoring Zeus for um, a couple of months. I was collecting the samples and checking them for uh, for anti-debugging techniques. And uh, actually, one of the samples uh, was quite interesting uh, because it used a Windows messaging system uh, in order to avoid. Um, emulation and, uh, and uh, sandboxing, especially if the sandbox uh, doesn't have uh, implemented all the, uh, doesn't emulate all the uh, GUI uh, mechanisms. And it also used SEH in another manner. And what was also interesting about this one, uh, this, uh, this sample was that uh, there were really uh, multiple downloaders. It's like um, Russian dolls, one inside the other. Uh, so each downloader was similar, used similar anti-techniques, uh, anti uh, and uh, each one was pointing to another one and another one and another one and another one and so on. So it was uh, well, a little bit funny. Uh, so first of all, it, uh, it uses the function uh, load uh, cursor to uh, execute the um, malicious um, routine, anti-debug and prepare. Uh, and uh, this routine, um, it uh, uses Windows messages, so malware sends the messages to, uh, window messages to itself. And um, after receiving the messages, it triggers uh, a, a specific function. So first message is, it sends is uh, get min max info. And uh, after sending this message, after receiving this message, it uh, triggers the uh, anti-debug uh, trick. Then uh, it uh, sends the uh, WMNC create uh, message, which uh, triggers checking the debugger uh, function. Then it sends NC calc size blah blah, uh, which uh, triggers the function done that uh, resolves uh, APIs. And at the end, uh, WM create, which uh, will trigger uh, allocating the buffer in the memory for uh, for the decrypted code. Uh, SEH anti-debug, um, it sets um, mm, also uh, the SEH um, mm, handler. And uh, um, it also uh, 
checks uh, the, uh, the return address from the uh, create window functions as a, another um, anti-debugging trick. So if the address is not uh, the one that malware expects, uh, it will uh, exit the process. Uh, otherwise, it will just return and the execution will continue. Uh, the anti-debug uh, technique um, is a little bit obfuscated with uh, the crazy numbers, but what it does is uh, reading and writing into the exception record. So it uh, checks the exception address in the, uh, in, uh, in the context record. Uh, it checks the exception address, and then uh, it writes uh, the exception address uh, to the SEI, uh, um, SEI, um, reg not register, SEI uh, in the, <laughs> the um, to the context record at uh, where the where the SEI is stored. And after coming back from uh, from uh, the handler routine, it will check the uh, e ESI. Um, uh, register and if uh, it's not uh, the one that uh, was set uh, inside the uh, handler routine, it will exit. And uh, then it will um, run the enum windows function um, to trigger the callback function that will decrypt uh, uh, the and run the downloader. And um, the downloader was uh, not really interesting, but it was just like a um, piece of code which uh, was designed to download uh, one binary from specified address. And uh, this address was not accessible anymore, so it was something uh, short-lived, which uh, also becomes, uh, a paradigm, becomes a paradigm uh, in the uh, contemporary malware, to, to use just uh, malware that will uh, do its, uh, its work and will disappear, so it's uh, untrackable. Um, then I stumbled upon even more hardened Zeus sample, uh, which uh, was designed for Windows 7, and uh, the anti-emulation technique uh, that it used was based on the default values uh, uh, of the CPU registers at uh, the entry point. Also, uh, this, this one is interesting because it drops a Necros rootkit, uh, which is uh, slightly against uh, my uh, claims that rootkits are on decline, because uh, in case of Necros, uh, the, the, the statistics are quite different, but it's just uh, one, uh, one example out of, um, of many more which are declining. Uh, so the code is really obfuscated with uh, a lot of dead code which never gets executed but uh, looks um, valid, looks legitimate. Uh, we have a lot of steps, so from one step we call it another step and so on and so on and so on. Uh, also there are some functions, GUI function used um, or library functions used in the, uh, the code which are uh, completely meaningless. So they are here just to confuse. And uh, finally, at uh, the seventh step, we have um, this, uh, this anti-emulation um, technique uh, I mentioned. It just um, checks the register, uh, the, the default values of the uh, EDI and EDX uh, registers. And uh, those values are different for Windows XP, different for Windows 7, they are different for uh, virtual machines, they are also different for uh, other, um, like for um, Windows XP with, uh, uh, with um, service pack 3 or Windows XP without any service pack, so uh, they, they kind of differ. Um, and based on this value, it uh, calculates another value and uh, uh, it checks if this value result if uh, the result is, or if this value results uh, in um, having like um, the least significant byte set or not and basi based on this information it can say if it's uh, run inside uh, windows 7 or not so if it's uh, not run inside windows 7 it will exit and the check is uh, done exactly here so it continued then to step eight, and then to step nine, and then to step blah, 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 up until step 17, which, which, uh, at which point it will uh, call the um, main function. Uh, so that, was the, that were uh, the, the samples I wanted to show you. Um, now, a quick summary. 
I already mentioned what were what are uh, the current goals of uh, of uh, malware writers of malware. So the f first one and the most uh, obvious one is bypass uh, bypassing the detection. What they are uh, using for that is anti-emulation and anti-heuristic techniques. Uh, other goal is protecting CNC infrastructure. So we have multiple downloaders. We have also waterhole web waterhole websites, which are um, the legitim uh, legitimate. Uh, uh, web servers that uh, got hacked and the malware is uh, served there. Usually they are very short-lived, short like um, the samples uh, are exist uh, existing on a specified website only for two or three days. And uh, other goal, which is protect uh, the payload, and we have anti-reversing techniques, anti-debugging, anti-VM, and lots of encryption and obfuscation, etc. Uh, and uh, um, about the architecture of, uh, of uh, contemporary malware, it usually comes uh, as a loader. The first, uh, first binary is a loader, which is really heavily um, armed with, pack, uh, with packers, with encryption, with uh, anti-debugging, anti-VM, anti-anti-anti techniques. And it, it, it's used to inject uh, and execute uh, the dropper code. The dropper code usually is also encrypted and also consists, uh, consists of uh, many stages of encryption and anti-debugging. Then it decrypts and executes the downloader or the bot code. Uh, then the bot code is usually small and simple and uh, it's uh, written like shell code, so uh, it's really straightforward. Uh, it also sometimes use, uh, uses some anti-techniques and it's used to just to decrypt, uh, to get, decrypt, and run the, pay, the payload. So usually the bot uh, consists, either, uh, either the bot um, consists of uh, a set of commands, like five or six commands, just to uh, download, write the file, overwrite, delete, something like that. Or there is just a downloader which, uh, which will download the, uh, the, um, the payload from specified hard-coded website and, um, and execute it. And a, a payload, uh, well, it's uh, interesting about the payload uh, that um, it's not really easy to get to the actual payload right now because, uh, well, in this, when, when we have a bot which uh, just uh, wait for a CNC to push the payload, uh, we can wait and wait and wait and wait and never uh, get the payload actually because uh, cyber criminals may, might not be interested in infecting our computer. Uh, and also payload is never stored on the disk, so it's just like downloaded on each reboot uh, or pushed by CNC uh, and stored in, in the memory. It's very short-lived usually and uh, it's uh, fully controlled by, uh, by, by CNC servers. So like I said, uh, sometimes it's uh, not that easy to get to the payload after uh, doing all the decryption and um, the obfuscation. Uh, this is the summary of, uh, of the techniques I mentioned. So we have um, time or condition based triggers which uh, can be, um, the, the code can be uh, triggered by only in specified time frames or can be encrypted, on, uh, decrypted properly only if uh, specified settings are found or specified events uh, are um, triggered. We have uh, a lot of env environmental checks, um, like checks for files on the disk, like checks uh, for strings in the registry, mutexes, or uh, window names. Uh, we have uh, something new. I, I, I haven't seen it before, the, the check of the initial values that are um, stored in CPU registers at the entry point. Uh, we can call it a fingerprinting the uh, operating system. And uh, we have uh, overrunning sandbox and emulators. So uh, also um, often there are used um, instructions that are uh, significantly slower inside uh, virtual machines and sandboxes, like uh, uh, instructions like uh, MMX or FPO instructions or get the count or other instructions that uh, might take more time in the, inside the VM. Uh, we have Benign uh, code, which is uh, code that looks uh, legitimately, uh, does legitimate system calls. Uh, and we have also s something that uh, last line called Stalin code. So here, kudos to last line <laughs> for, uh, for the name. Um, 
which, uh, which is uh, the code that doesn't use any syscalls. So uh, basically, uh, if, uh, if the sandbox doesn't emulate every instruction, just, uh, it just um, sets hook, hooks on syscalls and see only the syscalls, uh, it w won't, won't actually see the, uh, this kind of code. Um, we have also uh, using Windows messaging, which is also uh, something new for me, and APC procedures. So those samples were the first samples I uh, saw uh, these uh, techniques used. And uh, we have uh, use, uh, use of chain exception handling mechanisms, which were used in a pretty different, um, which, which is being used in pretty different manners. So, um, yeah. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, we should harden uh, our sandboxes, we should harden our emulators. We should, uh, uh, first thing we should do is, uh, we should get rid of all artifacts or all the traces that can uh, uh, tell the, the malware that is run in the, uh, in the emulator. So uh, the strings, the registry values, the names, uh, and so on and so on. Full emulation, so we should trace all instructions, not only the system calls. Uh, full exploration of code, which means that we should follow uh, multiple execution paths, not uh, only the, the main execution path which is taken, but we should emulate also the, the other, um, the other um, possibilities. And uh, also uh, we should get rid of, of the uh, dormant code. Uh, we should skip the stalling loops and sleep loops and uh, detect and skip the passive code. So that would be all. Thank you.